I first commenced my on-again, off-again career as a fast food chef just a few months before my 15th birthday uh, behind the kitchen counter of my local arcade. It's standard for all of age, and in my case slightly younger, members of my family to work, so as a resident of a Florida suburb at the time, I spent the next few years piloting to deep fryers, loading pizzas into a rolling oven, and logging my short breaks huddled in front of Pac-Man and Tekken arcade cabinets, as well as the Simpsons arcade game. Uh, to this day one of my favorites. Spending nights and weekends and summers walking about a mile in 90 degree heat to fry food and fix go-karts was hardly a grandiose calling, but what made this job so special besides the video games and the fine dining, of course, was the simple poetry of happenstance and necessity that characterizes working class life. And it's something that I still think about to this day. While the men and the women in my family have walked different paths in some ways, I will always remember how I flipped my first burgers up the road from the grocery chain where my father stocked shelves when he was about my age, from the construction yards when we used to sweep on early Saturday mornings on his days off from the fire station, from the church where we cut the grass for free for far too long. <laughs> my, my grandfather's fire station is down the road. My uncle's fire station, a poetic social geography that manages to bear a great deal of history um, over the better part of a century. Uh, and while as a young man I would have rather spent time at band practice or with my friends or reading, these seemingly ordinary and clearly workaday memories are held very dear, ultimately. You know, uh, remarkable about labor history is its ability to construct a very rich panorama in what we could say are, could be the simplest of terms, right? What appears like a parlor trick uh, is actually the description of a working class genealogy. It's the stuff of history that places person, object, uh, everything and everyone into a tapestry of experience and renders the narratives of ordinary people as meaningful, exemplary historical objects. I live in Massachusetts now, not far from the stretch of the Mass Turnpike, that same firefighting grandfather of mine earned his lifelong nickname of Pee Wee by crawling inside of a mountain. He was a little guy, it was easy for him to crawl through, so you see. Uh, the stretch of highway he helped build changes from cold concrete to a river of memory, and it's thrilling to think that what might feel so singular may also be universal in some way, or what appears marginal, essential, in some other way. A social prosopographic turn in working class memory, if you will. <laughs> now I doubt the validity of my own memory enough to pose significant critique of its own functions and the demonstrations of its potential for disunity or the alteration via social contingency, the way it changes our perceptions and understandings of social historical phenomena, but it's just this element that is remarkable and prescient in its both constructive and, you know, less constructive ways. In this critique, I recognize the glow of the past has a tendency to illuminate the cracks in neat canvases to reveal, say in this case, using labor history, what it took to fight fires and build a road in those days. Abuse, the destruction of the body, the subservience and buy-in to uh, myth-making that only services the rich and powerful. Can memory open up history? Can it be used to close things down again? I don't quite remember when YouTube's algorithm first introduced me to Nemo's dreamscapes, but it's given me this kind of like strange new like object to kind of place on my second monitor and zone out to during various breakdowns in the writing process. I'm writing a book, by the way. Um, Nemo's Dreamscapes. These nostalgia-driven, contempo, vintage, digital constructions, they certainly trigger, you know, certain personal memories for me, but th this is 100% this is Nemo's world. Elements of cultural turns in the 1940s in the 1950s, animated still images uh, ranging from 
extremely famous art like Edward Hopper's Nighthawks, various Rockwell and Rockwell-esque mid-century Americana, and other still images either reminiscent of or actual uh, 1940s and 50s advertisement, accompanied by a sound, a similar soundtrack of you know, standards music from that same period. All uh, accompanied with I'm sure we're familiar with this element. ASMR kind of additional, you know, it's coming from another room. It's raining outside. A cigarette emits an eternal wisp of smoke. Warm beverages endlessly steam, never growing cold, and mixed out highs combined with reverb draw you into this kind of virtual thought object. It's tossed into the abyss of a locked groove nostalgia interesting a woman throws her hands up in excitement while taking in a beachside view from a convertible uh, a child reads a book by moonlight as adults enjoy cocktails and dancing downstairs and we've all been invited to take in the dreamscapes together or we've been invited into the submarine i'm assuming that nemo is a jules verne reference but i don't I've always been weirdly into like mid-century standards and swing music, so I guess the algorithm really got me there. But I, rather than kind of like accepting the invitation to participate in this weird sort of like retro online project, I'm reminded about how nostalgia, it remains this very powerful driving force in the culture industry, and it's something that a currency that we've continued to reevaluate over the years. From Tradwife TikTok to ASMR YouTube, it seems to necessitate this kind of additional buy-in of the nostalgia of everyday life. There's a lot of people who seem to kind of intuitively sense that capitalist modernity has been failing them in some ways, and then they kind of attempt to assuage this anxiety with this kind of collage. It's interesting, this ASMR YouTube channel it's like a simulacrum of a particular historical time brought back from the dead by this kind of occultic Don Draper figure. But it's a little, it's, it's a little, I, I honestly, it's a little more insidious to think that rather than actually selling products, now you're just using the advertisement to sell an experience. You're not trying to use people's feelings as a motivation toward purchasing goods but rather encouraging those feelings using the advertise. <laughs> you see what I mean? People who are attached to these types of cultural expressions are probably feel that it's in some way countercritical. By some measure, or by some virtue of their distance, uh, the political implications wrapped in this critique of modernity cut against the contemporary grain rather than with it. But not only is that like a weak critique. It uses the primary engine of consumer capitalism to critique the logical conclusions that we're dealing with today. But that the bad news is that this presented idyllic alternatives to uh, our contemporary moment never really actually existed. This is just, it's, it's advertising. With the locked groove criticality of reactionary ideology, these ideas are instead relegated to largely aesthetic choices and articulating a persistent theme that places hallucinatory memory and absent nostalgia at the center of subjectivizing cultural experiences. Scenes of appliance advertisements and paintings of Batman are intermixed with great American realism, all scenes and contexts moved over by this apparition. It's the work of Edward Hopper, zombified. His corpse is dancing on YouTube.com while Cole Porter and Tommy Dorsey's band and the ink spots play solemnly in the background. Oh, buddy. I don't like it. makes me mad. I, I don't like that. Don't do that. Uh, the incredible melancholy and wartime anxiety of modern living, the real stuff worth exploring in these works of art is painfully exchanged for the placating act of remembering your past life from the 1950s oldies music playing in another room cooking asmr live oldies playing in another room it's a great night open window crickets ambience watching tv with your nuclear family so an incredible fundamental context for all historical phenomena is always lost to time uh, but in this case this kind of cultural production cuts directly against historicity and constructs a distorted image of a past that was both lost and never actually existed in the first place 
Pop music is always rubbish. It's always 90% rubbish. At the moment, it's 99% rubbish. That's what I'm complaining about. And hey, you know, I get it. We're all nostalgic for something. I mean, there's something addictive in the language of pop. Uh, that I, th- I think that has us in, in many ways still struggling with the problem of copies of copies of copies that are then reinventing themselves, you know, furthering this sort of social mutation process that keeps cultural vision so small. Um, it gives a real sense of why things go viral. I think that's a very descriptively useful term. <laughs> you know, but, but it's not just a problem of form, also a problem of spirit and affect. Uh, which is just the same sort of spectral nostalgia as Nemo that markets itself as forward thinking. You know, this empty, optimistic joy garbage I've been known to have some opinions on in the past. The Flash Mob, what, one of the most fascist of American creations. <laughs> <laughs> so here is what here is what's incredibly fascistic about this Katy Perry Pikachu crossover. Performative joy. They'll try and bring you down, but you've got the power now. So obscene dance on the grave of insurrectionary politics. I think it is liberal authoritarianism. And that was the end of the Bush years. What optimism does anyone have? Peter Gordon's introduction to the authoritarian personality by Theodore Adorno. This pink slurry of concentrated chicken parts that are separated, battered, and fried into nuggets. But it's important to remember that like pop music's addiction to its own imagined past is the result of years of actual cultural novelty and ingenuity, critique and reaction and sublation. And what's so absolute shit about so much of what's available to us now is that it is either a complete disinterest or blissful ignorance of the already present innovations in the forms they purport to reference in the fucking first place. Allow me to pull several examples out of my ass. Uh, this is barely really scratching the surface of these kinds of the kinds of exploration of rhythmic theme you know this you know this really fun and interesting thing retaining some composite uh, uh, isolating the elements of some composition stretching them to their various limits speeding them up slowing them down adding dissonance adding polyphony contrapuntal melody the this the the most basic forms of musical and cultural exploration um, that have found popular and mainstream success in the 20th and the 21st centuries that some have argued was ultimately captured by incentives and drive toward repetition, uh, profiteering, and the slow cancellation of the future. That while these days less convincing uh, has become, in my opinion, more persistent and ridiculous as time passes. De- desperate, maybe. That's a good word for it. This is why the best and most effective hauntological musical projects are attempts to not bring the dead to life, necessarily, but to speak with ghosts. That which, quote, can only dwell at the periphery of the sensible in glimmers, shimmers, and suggestions. The obvious examples I think still apply here. The Caretaker Project, and if you come to think of it, Nemo's Dreamscape is just the the caretaker but with head completely empty Uh, a a spectral cultural moment that explored the idea of a presence that is formed by the very idea of disintegration absence and the essential fragility of memory rather than aesthetic choice the fragmentation and disintegrating power of time are part of the artistic subjective position itself there's, there's a really big difference. There's a lot to gain from the counter intuition of culture that has been dehistoricized after years of retromania. Um, uh, in historicizing the disunity 
within now retro culture, I think, maybe has the potential to dislodge some new interpretations and alternative meanings that don't require us to placate this reactionary sensibility. Speaking for myself, the descriptions of over-ambitious young love, these arrive to me in the form of absent memories. Um, they're filled with this really beautiful sense of melancholy of what could have been if it weren't for the darkness that comes with being closeted, the awful truth that in many places young people still have to hope and pray for the ability to experience their youth free of condemnation and judgment, which is this very simple thing everyone seems to have an opinion on now, but this feeling that is intimately connected to the freedom of being young and in love and years that you can't get back. How life flashes by and when we look back we can feel slighted by choices made for us by people in power who don't understand us. Choices that were ultimately outside of our control. And I just wanted to imagine a future for myself at that age. To act on my feelings and have them returned. But that didn't come until much later. In a way it's a real pity. But by virtue of distance time actual experience and the absence of experience something queer emerges in this sort of wink and nod love of you know rest purposefully restrained popular romantic music this sense of protective secrecy and hidden desire that comes largely in this case from without rather from then rather than from within the pop cultural fantasy the stakes are changed and with a potential enormous blowback or payoff. And I gotta say, the youthfulness, the vibrancy, for all of its context of normativity and the fact that they're made by these hit factory weirdos using all of these sort of cultural rules that have long since been complicated and disrupted, they can remind us of the evocative power of absence in culture. The necessity by contingency for countercurrents in thought on memory in all of its forms, and a way of reopening the past without falling prey to re emerging forms of, of old social engineering. I don't get invited to Thanksgiving dinner anymore because I kept doing dialectics to my family. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't care for it. Okay, you have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, no. Make me bitch. <laughs>